Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeremy Collins. I'm the director of conferences and symposia here at the National World War II Museum's Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. We've got a great show in store for us today, and it's my pleasure to give a brief introduction of our featured author and then lead him in a conversation and interview about this wonderful book, Paper Bullets. Dr. Jeffrey Jackson is professor of history at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. He received his BS with high honors from the University of Vanderbilt and a PhD in history from the University of Rochester. At Rhodes, he teaches modern European history, cultural history, French history, environmental studies, and interdisciplinary humanities. In 2011, Dr. Jackson won the prestigious Clarence Day Award for Outstanding Research, which is Rhodes' highest honor for the faculty. In addition to the book we're gonna speak on today, he is the author of Paris Underwater, How the City of Light Survived the Great Flood of 1910, and Making Jazz French, Music and Modern Life in Interwar Paris, both of which have been received with high acclaim. In addition to these titles, he has co-edited many books and written many articles, which I will omit for time's sake today. His most recent book, Paper Bullets, was long listed for the 2021 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in nonfiction and selected as an editor's choice for best of the best for 2020 by book list. He's received many other uh, accolades and awards and long lists for this wonderful title. Uh, but Dr. Jackson, thank you for joining us here. We wish we had you in New Orleans in person, but uh, we're delighted to have you on our virtual webinar today. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. It's a real honor to be able to participate in an event through the National World War II Museum. So, uh, so thank you so much for having me. Thanks to everyone who's tuned in today. Well, it's, uh, let's get started. It's, a, as I mentioned, a great book about two remarkable and unsung heroines. Uh, before we get into the question and answer with the two of us, could you tell us a little bit about the book? How did you come across this story? Who are these two women? And what exactly are paper bullets? Well, let me start with the last question, uh, sort of answering this this question of what are paper bullets, because it's a, it's a term that some folks might be familiar with, but others might not be. Um, I actually took the term from uh, allied psyops uh, manuals and documents that I uh, investigated as part of the research for this. So psychological operations uh, by the allies during the war, I, there was a, a, a manual that, that, uh, that they wrote and in, the, in this manual referred to their own operations as paper bullets. And what they meant by that were uh, leaflets, pamphlets, uh, other kind of information that the allies would drop uh, behind German lines, basically to try to convince the German soldiers to, to give up, to surrender, to, uh, to, to stop the, the war effort. Um, and I took that phrase, that term, um, because it applied directly to what the women that I write about in this book, to what they were doing. Now, they came up with this on their own. They invented uh, basically their own version of this, uh, their own psyops campaign. Um, on the island of Jersey, where they were, uh, where they were living at the time, Jersey is one of the, the, the Channel Islands right off the French coast and the only bit of British soil that was uh, conquered dur during World War II by the German army. So these two women basically decided uh, to do their own uh, psychological operations campaign um, and they wrote their own notes. They wrote notes to the German soldiers in, in German because one of them was fluent in German. Um, and the notes basically tried to demoralize the German soldiers, told them, you know, the war is meaningless, you should give up, you should go home. Um, your family is at home waiting for you. They often appeal to, to, to feeling a family and, to, uh, and to, to that sense of responsibility. Um, and so they, these notes took a lot of different forms. Sometimes they were songs, sometimes they were poems, sometimes they were um, little drawings, sometimes they were kind of more like manifestos, sometimes they were little bits of dialogue that they had invented. Um, but uh, all of them were designed to basically get inside the minds of the German soldiers to convince them that the war wasn't worth fighting, that they should give up, go home, uh, leave the island of Jersey where, they, uh, where this was taking place um, and go back to their families. So this was essentially a creative campaign um, uh, 
that really came out of, you asked me who, who these women were. Well, they were artists. I mean, they were creative people. Um, they had spent a lot of their life in Paris um, amidst the avant-garde, the modern, ed, modern cutting edge art scene in Paris in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, and so they knew how to create. They knew how to create messages. They knew how to communicate ideas. Um, Suzanne Malherbe, who you see here on the left of your screen, she was a, a, an illustrator. She was uh, an artist. Uh, and Lucy Schwab, the other one uh, that you see on your screen, she was a writer. And so they had worked together for many years. They had collaborated for many years. Their lives were very much intertwined um, through this creative work and also through their own relationship. They were a couple. Uh, they were a lesbian couple had fallen in love many years earlier when they were teenagers. They had grown up together uh, in the city of Nantes, which is in the southern part of France, um, and had known each other for a long time. So their lives were intertwined at a personal level, at a creative level. And then when they moved to Jersey and found themselves in this extraordinary situation of being under occupation, they put those skills to work uh, by creating these notes um, that, um, that were designed to, to make the Germans think twice. Um, you also asked me about uh, how I came, uh, came to this project. Um, I, I always say that uh, I have to give my wife full credit for this. Uh, I always listen to my wife. Uh, that's good advice, right? And uh, my wife is an art historian, actually. And so she knew about um, the work of Suzanne and Lucy under their artistic names. They took on new artistic names. Um, Suzanne was known as Marcel Moore and Lucy, Lucy Schwab was known as Claude Cahoon. Um, and these are the names they're famous for today if you ever see any of their work. And, and what you, if you do know their work, if you have seen their work, um, it's their photography. Um, they, they also collaborated on this really cutting edge photography. And so um, their work hangs in many, many very important and famous museums today. But, um, but, I, but I came to it through their photography because my wife introduced me to that. Um, and she knew a little bit about the wartime story, but not a whole lot. And actually a lot of people um, have sort of known about their wartime story, but really haven't written about it in any great detail. So when I uh, started to learn more about them and, and realized that very little had been written about the war experience, I thought this would be a great project to work on. And here we have uh, one of their paper bullets uh, as an example, but we'll get to a few more of their, their propaganda pieces later in the conversation. Do you have anything you want to uh, point out on this one in particular? Well, this just demonstrates the, the kind of notes that they were writing. Um, so a lot of them were typed like this. They had an Underwood typewriter uh, that they kept in their house on Jersey. They uh, would type these notes. Part, partly they typed it to obscure any handwriting. Um, they, um, they also allowed them to type multiple copies. So they would put several different sheets of paper through the typewriter and they would be able to tape, type many different copies at once. So they were producing hundreds of these notes. Um, finally, when they're, uh, not to skip too far ahead to the story, but when they're, when they're caught and they're put on trial, the, the Germans have some, somewhere on the order of 350 of their notes. Um, but when they're asked about how many they actually produced, they can't come up with a number because there were so many, they weren't even counting. Uh, how many there were. So, um, so they uh, uh, were just, you know, doing this on a pretty constant basis over the four years uh, that, that, uh, that, they be, that they undertake this project. One thing that you do notice from this note, you see at the very bottom there, a signature. Um, it says, also sprach der Soldat ohne Namen, which means thus spoke the soldier with no name. Um, and so what, what they did there was to create, they created a, a new identity. They created this fictional character, so to speak, and they called him the soldier with no name. And the reason that they did that was because they wanted to make it look like these notes were coming from within the German army itself. It added, they felt that it added authenticity, it added realism, um, and it also kind of gave a different spin on it. If it was just two civilians writing a note to the soldiers, it might be easily dismissed. But if it was something coming from within the German mind, coming from within the German army, um, there was a sense that it would have a greater impact. Um, and I think for me, part of the evidence of that impact is the fact that they were, uh, they were hunted for four years by the, by the secret field police on Jersey. They, they took it very seriously. They did not see this as something that was sort of a silly activity uh, or something that they could easily ignore because at the end of the day, these were notes that were designed to demoralize the troops. Um, and if they were in fact coming from within the army, as the notes implied through this, this signature of this fictional character that the women had created, then that suggested that maybe there was a conspiracy within the army. And that was something that the, the, the military leaders took very seriously. 
Thank you. Um, let's go into a little bit about their background before we get into their wartime experience. You had referenced their, uh, their avant-garde, their artwork. Uh, we have a couple images of them during the, what are called the crazy years in Paris, the interwar years between 1919 and 1938, 1939, Paris, France. Um, what, what in their experience here or in their childhoods helped form who they were and um, maybe establish some political sensitivities mm -hmm. um, and direction? Well, I think one of the th ways that I talk about them is that they really are resistors for their whole lives. In other words, they don't just wake up one day during the war and decide that they're going to resist. They've been involved in some kind of resistance activity, pushing back um, for a long time. And some of that starts um, when their children, in particular for Lucy. So Lucy's father's family was Jewish. And even though Lucy herself uh, was not observant, she didn't identify as Jewish or practice the faith, she, um, she understood essentially what you might say were the consequences of that because um, her father was a newspaper editor and, um, and publisher and writer. And um, there was a very famous episode, some folks may have heard of this, it's a very complicated story, we don't have time to go into it, but a very famous episode called the Dreyfus Affair. And the Dreyfus Affair was a very significant anti-Semitic episode in France where a Jewish army captain was basically accused of treason um, and giving military secrets to the German army, but really he was scapegoated uh, because he was Jewish. And that sparked this entire controversy that lasted for many years. And Lucy's father, as an intellectual, as a newspaper uh, author, he had sided with Dreyfus. He had, he, would, he had written articles defending Dreyfus. In fact, he knew Dreyfus. Dreyfus was a schoolmate of his. And <clears throat> what that led to was in her hometown of Nantes, and there both of them grew up in the city of Nantes, it led to crowds outside of the family's apartment shouting down with the Jews. Um, and also Lucy had herself had uh, come under uh, attack by schoolmates um, when she was a little bit older. Um, they shouted anti-Semitic taunts and pelted her with rocks in the schoolyard. So she understood the power of hate. She'd been on the receiving end of that. Um, and when Hitler came to power, um, she certainly, you know, by that point, they were living in Paris. They knew they had, they had seen the rise of Mussolini in 1922. Um, and then by 1933, with the rise of Hitler to power, they understood um, the danger. They, they had at least a sense of the danger here. And so um, in addition to being part of the avant-garde art scene, in addition to producing this cutting edge work um, that they were doing, experimenting um, with new you know, understandings about, uh, about beauty and, and art and, and representation, they, um, they were also uh, engaged in um, sort of uh, activities on the political left. They, they became connected with communism. They were never doctrinaire or orthodox communists. Um, but they joined uh, and, and knew and had friends with a lot of people on the political left. In large part, that was because uh, many people, many politically engaged people of the day really believed that the only real bulwark against fascism was communism. It was the only force that could really somehow rise to stop, uh, the, to stop Hitler. Um, so, they were, so they were engaged in, in politics, certainly, but also they were uh, engaged in what you might say was a kind of gender politics. Um, a lot of the work that they produced a lot of the images, the photographs that they produced really involved a kind of crossing of gender lines. Um, these new names, for example, that they took on, Claude Cahoon and Marcel Moore that I referred to earlier, Claude is a name that can be used by both men and women in France. So it's kind of a gender neutral name. And um, a lot of the work as you see here on the screen involves sort of playing with ideas about masculine and feminine men and women, how, how, what that looks like, how that's represented. Um, and so in, in all of these different ways, whether it was in their personal relationship, whether it was in their artistic work, whether it was in their politics, um, they, were, um, they were very much um, you know, engaged with those kinds of questions. And I think that that's really what led them later on in life to, uh, to decide to stand up. Because as I said, most people don't you know, wake up and decide to be a resistor. It's something that comes out of a lifelong pattern. And I think that's another reason why uh, in the book I talk about uh, the way that they, in this, in this photography in particular, that they cross gender lines, I think that becomes important for them again when they invent this new personality of the soldier with no name, because here, is, here are two women 
who are essentially masquerading or pretending to be a man, pretending to be a German soldier as they write these notes. So this was something that was also familiar, familiar to them. They had, uh, had done that before. Um, and so it really comes out of the, the, these larger patterns in their lives. And then this, uh, this last photo of their interwar years that, I've, that we've included in the slide show is of Lucy posing as, as an homage to her father with the... Uh, that's right. That's right. So Lucy, um, as I said, she was not, uh, and in fact, her father was not either a practicing Jew. They had, they had assimilated, they had sort of given up their faith, but, um, but there was still a, a, an understanding and an awareness of the Jewish heritage on her father's side of the family. Um, her grandmother, Lucy's grandmother, her, her paternal grandmother had taught her about her Jewish heritage. There were some prominent rabbis in the family. Uh, there were some prominent scholars of Jewish history in the family. And so Lucy really sort of embraced elements of her Jewish heritage, not so much because she believed in the particular tenets of the faith, but rather um, because it allowed her to sort of embrace a kind of outsider identity. Um, I mean, as I just described, you know, the, this Dreyfus affair was an example of the ways in which Jews were marginalized in France at this period. And so Lucy saw herself, I think, in many ways partly because of if she was a lesbian, partly because of her artistic work, partly because of her politics, and then also because of her family uh, heritage, saw herself in, in so many ways as an outsider. And so, um, <clears throat> so that's what you see her doing here is kind of you know, comparing herself to her father, um, thinking about her Jewishness, um, and really kind of embracing at least elements of that. And I, as, I, as I say, I think that will go on to inform and to, uh, to really sort of motivate them as they as they resist the Nazis. So um, they they vacation in the Channel Islands, the island of Jersey, mm -hmm. before the war comes, but they make their way to Jersey on the eve of the war as they know things are going to go from bad to worse. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Channel Islands, but also talk to us about the uh, June 28th, 1940 Operation Green Arrow, where the Germans decide that they do need a presence in the Channel Islands. Right. So they go to Jersey because, uh, as you say, they, um, they'd been there many times over the years. It was a, a vacation spot. Lucy suffered from chronic health problems. And so um, having a sort of peaceful respite, a place where they could go that was familiar to them was really important. Um, by the mid 30s, Paris is becoming very polarized politically. I mean, we think that our politics now are polarized. It's nothing like Paris in the 30s because people were literally, you know, on a regular basis, people were literally clashing in the streets over political questions. And there was a coup attempt at one point in the mid 1930s in Paris. There were a number of, of things that really were just kind of ramping up as in addition to the fear of um, the fear of what was going to happen with the, with the Germans. Was there going to be another war? People really um, didn't know at this point, but they certainly saw the signs pointing towards some kind of conflict. So Lucy and Suzanne decided to, to go to Jersey to move there permanently in 1937. It was, as they've said, as a place they knew well. Um, they bought a, a house there um, and set up uh, and basically they were, it was essentially sort of retirement for them in a way, a kind of, you, you might say, um, early retirement. By this point, they were in their late forties. They had money that they had inherited from their families. They were never, as I, I talk about them uh, in their Paris days, they were never starving artists. They were never, <laughs> uh, you know, they didn't really have to work hard to make a living as artists because they did have resources that they could draw on. So moving to Jersey then, you know, is, is kind of an escape for them. Um, and they, they uh, it, it also allows Lucy to, to relax and to deal with her chronic ill health um, issues. Um, the islands are beautiful. Let me say a quick word about the Channel Islands and then I'll mention uh, Operation Green Arrow. If you've never been to the Channel Islands, you should go. It's a beautiful <laughs> and wonderful place. It's a series of seven islands. It's just off the coast of Normandy, um, much closer to France than it is to Britain but it is, uh, they are British crown dependencies. So they are connected to the British crown. They're loyal to the British monarch. Um, they're they're self-governing. Um, so the, you know, the British crown appointed a, a lieutenant governor, but otherwise the each island elected its, or the two main islands at least, elected their own uh, parliaments and were self-governing. Uh, 
um, Jersey has for a long time also been a, a tax haven. So um, I've always wondered if that was part of the <laughs> decision to move there. I can't quite prove that with Lucy and Suzanne, but certainly it was well known at that point already as a, as a, a, a tax haven. Um, when they get there, they settle in, they think they're gonna live a very peaceful life um, until June of 1940 um, when the German army arrives. Before that, you know, the, basically the British say, we can't defend this island. We can't defend these islands. We, we, they are part of our territory, but we're not able to defend them. So the British army withdraws um, and leaving the islands essentially uh, defenseless. Their one hope is that by leaving them defenseless, that the Germans, if they do come to take over the islands, that they won't do it violently because they'll say, you know, the, the hope is that the, the German army will say, well, we, there's no need for us to bomb or there's no need for us to, to engage in any military acti activity here because there's no, there's no threat here. Unfortunately, the British forget to tell the Germans this. And so the Germans are unaware that the islands are defenseless. They've been doing reconnaissance. They see um, basically what they see from the air, they see trucks moving around the island not realizing that these trucks are participating in the potato and tomato harvest. The Jersey grows a lot of potatoes and tomatoes. So they think that, it, that they're military uh, trucks. And so when they do uh, come to the islands, they, they come violently. They bomb the, major, the, the two major cities, uh, uh, St. Helier on Jersey and St. Peterport on Guernsey, one of the other islands. They strafe with bullets and a number of people do die. In, uh, local Jersey folks do die in, in this raid. But eventually the, the, the military shows up at the airport. Um, they land uh, in a plane and the, the bailiff, who's the, the main elected leader, it's the bailiwick of Jersey and the, the leader is the bailiff. He, all he can really do is show up to the airport and shake hands and surrender uh, and surrender the island. Um, very quickly, you start to see then the introduction of hundreds and even thousands of troops onto the islands because the islands come to be the leading edge of what the Germans would call their Atlantic Wall. Um, so this idea of the Atlantic Wall that stretches from Scandinavia through the Channel Islands down the French coast, it was essentially seen as a, as a barrier um, to allied invasion, to protect the, the conquered con continent from any allied attack. And the Channel Islands are really on the front lines of that. Um, as I said, it's the only piece of British soil that the Germans conquered during the war, but it has this really strategic value for them. Um, and so as a result, they see this as a place where, um, you know, they use it for defensive purposes. They launch, they also launch aircraft for the Battle of Britain from uh, the Channel Islands. They see it as really important. And so they don't want, they can't tolerate any, any dissent there. And so they police it very heavily. Now it's not, there's not a, a lot of uh, violence that takes place uh, on the islands, but it is definitely something that they are heavily policing because they don't want there to be any kind of uh, any kind of dissent. They certainly don't want people, local population, passing messages to the British or to the Allies. Um, you can see here the the, the local newspaper uh, very heavily censored. Um, and actually, I begin the book with a with an episode of Lucy and Suzanne distributing notes uh, to sticking them on the windows of German staff cars parked outside of the the offices of the newspaper, the Jersey Evening Post, um, because they knew that there were soldiers there. And again, they were hoping that these notes would get to the soldiers and that they would read them. And they knew that that was a place where they could find German staff cars um, to, to put their notes. So, um, so, the, so the Channel Islands, um, you know, there, there is this kind of, there is on the one hand, there is a kind of cooperation that the local population engages with. They really have very little choice if they want to continue to sort of go about their lives, an awful lot of the um, of the local population ends up working for the German military, either directly or indirectly. Um, but at the same time, there's also a kind of homegrown grassroots resistance. Um, and Lucy and Suzanne are, are not alone. Now, they're not connected with these other folks who are resisting. They don't really even realize it until much later that there are other people on the island who start to resist. But, um, but there is this kind of, you know, it, it's kind of two things happening at once. On the one hand, they're local population is cooperating, but there's a significant part of the population that's also finding some way to push back. It might be sabotage, it might be stealing from the Germans, it might be um, you know, just sort of ignoring them, refusing to shake hands with them. There are different levels of that kind of resistance, but um, it's something that, uh, that Lucy and Suzanne are, are not alone in uh, on the island. In the 
the portion on the Atlantic wall. Um, this gets into Lucy and Suzanne's proximity to what the Germans were doing in their once peaceful life on Jersey. Um, here we have some men training on the beach. Um, the two buildings, the two prominent buildings in this slide, you identified it. Could you tell us a little bit about them and what the hotel was for? Sure. So the St. Berlades Bay Hotel, which you see here uh, kind of in the center, more or less of the of the image, the big building, that was a, a building, first of all, it was a hotel that was very important in Lucy and Suzanne's life. That's where they stayed on vacation for many years uh, over the over the years when they would whenever they would come before they moved there permanently. And um, so they knew that well, they knew the area well. This is the beach where they would have swam, where they would have uh, walked and, uh, and, and strolled along uh, and relaxed. The house there on the left, which I've ident identified with an arrow, is the house that they will end up purchasing in 1937. So when they move to Jersey, they move to this part of the island that's very familiar to them. Um, Lucy describes it, she, she nicknames the house, just sort of jokingly, she nicknames it the, the, um, the um, I, I, I'm forgetting the name exactly now, but it's something, it's like the farm. It's like the, the, the farm without a name or something like that. Um, because um, it's the, when, they, when they move there, it's sort of overgrown and they have to kind of tame it. But it's also this kind of big house that's made out of big Jersey stone, this, this brown local stone. So it kind of feels safe. It feels like a fortress for them, but it's something that would have been very familiar. They would have seen it for all those years as they were walking along the beach. This hotel, though, during the war will become um, important for them because this is where the German officers had a, a club. This was the German officers club. So it's, it's literally across the street from their house. And sometimes they would hear German officers, they would hear them talking, they would, he they would hear them shooting off uh, rounds in the, in the night, they'd get drunk and, and shoot their pistols. Sometimes they would even find, Lucy and Suzanne would find bullets on their property the next morning. Um, so here they are, you know, going about this, this clandestine operation of, of, of hiding these notes, writing and hiding these notes around uh, the island, but there were literally uh, officers right across the street. And on the other side of them, just down the road from their house, was uh, an organization Todd camp, so a forced labor camp, um, men who had been brought in from the east to help to build the fortifications that were part of this Atlantic wall. Um, and then also nearby was the cemetery where German soldiers who died on Jersey were buried in the church cemetery, right? I mean, within a stone's throw of their house. So there was a real intimacy that they had, you might say, with, um, with the soldiers. They were surrounded by German officers at the club, by the German dead in the, in the cemetery, and by uh, uh, soldiers and, and forced labor just down the road. Um, this is a small island after all, it's only 45 square miles. So, so there was always gonna be an intimacy, but that's particularly true um, even right there at their house. And the slide that you put up, you know, it was sort of a couple of the questions that I had to kind of think about um, as I did this, uh, this project, because they did have a lot to lose. They, these were two women who had a lot to lose. Uh, they didn't have to do this work. They didn't have to do this resistance work. This was something that, um, that they could have just shut the doors of this big farmhouse that they had and, and kind of closed themselves off. Um, but instead they, they did chose to actively resist. And you see in the image here, um, this is a photo they took from their window and there you see a, a, a group of German soldiers out there doing reconnaissance on the beach. Um, so you, you get again, the, the feeling of kind of intimacy um, of the, the experience of the proximity of soldiers in their lives. Yeah, and Jeff, um, being lesbians, Lucy having Jewish heritage, uh, this photo in its own right was illegal because they weren't supposed to have cameras. How did they maneuver? How did they live amongst their neighbors who presumably had suspicions as to their relationship? Uh, but more importantly, how did they live amongst the Germans and the occupiers? It's a great question. I think that they had become very practiced at sort of um, at hiding, hiding a lot of things, hiding aspects of their relationship, certainly. I mean, Paris in the 1920s, um, there was a kind of openness to a uh, gay and lesbian community, but at the same time, there was also, um, it, was, it was not certainly accepted by everyone. So I think they had already learned how to sort of hide aspects of who they were and their relationship. When they moved to Jersey, 
um, they told everyone the truth. And I'd forgotten to mention this detail earlier. Um, the truth was that they were, in addition to being a lesbian couple, they were also stepsisters. Um, Lucy's uh, divorced father had married Suzanne's widowed mother in 1917. So from the time that they were teenagers um, and had already begun their own relationship, they were also stepsisters as well. So when they moved to Jersey, they just told everyone we're sisters. And that was actually not a lie. That was something that, that um, was you know, essentially true. And so that gave them another way to, to kind of deflect, um, deflect any, any doubts that people might have had. They, they mostly kept to themselves. I mean, Lucy was very introverted, um, didn't you know, wanna talk to a lot of people or connect with a lot of people. Suzanne was, was much more social and much more extroverted. But uh, with Lucy's ill health, you know, Suzanne was really taking care of her. They had a live-in maid uh, in their house uh, and her husband also, or the man she would marry, moved into the house as well. Um, but as far as I can tell, the maid and her husband did not know anything about what they were doing with writing the notes. They were somehow able to keep that uh, secret. And my guess is that you know, Lucy's response, if, if was, she was asked about it, she would say, well, I'm a writer, which she was, right? <laughs> so she, of course, had a typewriter. Um, there was only one person who knew what they were up to with writing these notes and, and distributing them around. And that was a friend that they had made many years ago. And, and she was the only person that, that they took into their confidence. Um, so they, there was, you know, they, they, they did a lot of, of things to sort of obscure what they were doing. And, and a lot of this work was also done in secret. So they would write the notes at home uh, alone, close the doors, write these notes, type them up. And then what they would do is they would put them in the pockets of their, they, they would wear these big Burberry overcoats and they would stuff them down in the pockets or they would have a shopping bag um, and they would put the notes in the shopping bag and just go around their regular routine, run some errands, go to the store, whatever. And on, on the way, they would pull out a note and they would leave it on a cafe table or they would pin it to a fence post or they would stick it in a mail slot or they would put it inside of a German car, as I mentioned. Um, or in some cases, they would slip it into the pocket of a German soldier as they were walking past on the busy street. Um, and so he would you know, not realize that somebody, someone had put something in his pocket. He would later reach in, find the note and look at it and then you know, be confronted with the message uh, of the note. So, um, so they found these ways, they found these ways to kind of be very, uh, very clever and very secret um, about their work and otherwise just kind of keeping to themselves. And it allowed them to go on uh, like this for, for four years until eventually someone does, someone does rat them out, someone does turn them in. Um, and and then, uh, then, then the story gets, gets much darker at that point. And we won't uh, we won't reveal who that was. Uh, it's, I'll I'll speak for the author. You got to buy the book for that one. But uh, <laughs> we our next few slides show the Atlantic Wall, uh, and you can see the tiny dots next to the red arrow representing the Channel Islands. Um, and here are some of the POWs um, that were captured. Eastern Front, North Africa, and sent as the organization taught to build portions of the Atlantic Wall. And um, tell us a little bit about this before we get into some of the paper bullet examples. So um, the map on the left shows the forced labor camps around Jersey. So, so there were several forced labor camps. Um, it was not just the one that was near their home but there were um, a number of people who were coming, um, being brought from the East. So as I said, there were, you know, there ended up being thousands of, of German soldiers um, and also hundreds of forced laborers. So the, so the presence, you know, just think about the presence of, uh, of these men who've been brought uh, or, or who are, who've arrived um, from elsewhere is just, phenomenal uh, in terms of thinking about just this small island. On the right-hand side, you see the orders of the commandant. This, these are the kind of initial, and it's published in the Jersey Evening Post. That's what you see there. It's the, the masthead of the Evening Post. These are the, the list of initial regulations at the beginning of the war. Curfews, um, things like uh, everyone has to set their clock an hour ahead so they'll be on Berlin time, um, using occupation marks instead of local currency or British pounds, which is what they were using before. Um, they have to stop driving on the left-hand side of the road as you would have in, in, in Britain, instead start driving on the right-hand side of the road. So all of these kind of regulations that begin that process of creating this as an occupied territory, 
uh, that's what you see on the on the right hand side. And that last regulation doesn't sound too abnormal for me. Uh, <laughs> the driving on the right side of the road. Uh, I've been to Guernsey once, and it really is a whole nother world. It's it's beautiful. It's unique. And these two images on the left side, the top left corner and the bottom left corner, are parts of the Atlantic Wall on mm -hmm. Jersey, but they have the same on Guernsey. And just these huge concrete structures that are meant for observation um, posts for the artillery and for the men who are billeted behind the coastline. Um, so it's this beautiful, quaint sort of other world place. And then it's it is still dotted and scarred with, with remnants of occupation. Absolutely. So tell us about their, uh, their campaign. Tell us about uh, who their targets were. We have a few of them listed here and, and how they tried to appeal, as you mentioned, to the average soldier, not to the officers or Berlin. Right, so when they make this decision to write the notes um, and to invent this, this persona of the soldier with no name, it's really a, for them a strategy that's designed to um, not only to get inside the minds of the ordinary soldier, but also to try to drive a wedge between um, the troops and the officers, but also the leaders back uh, in Berlin. So a lot of the notes are really directly speaking to this kind of gap, this gap between officers and men, right? I mean, this note right here, right? It's like, you know, Hitler leads us, Goebbels speaks for us, Goering gobbles for us, you know, all these other things, but no one dies for us, right? So the kind of getting the men to think about who's speaking for you, who's, who's helping you, who's working for you, nobody, right? Uh, certainly not the leaders. So you should start thinking of your own safety. You should start thinking of your own, uh, your own family, your own life, rather than thinking about what these, these people are telling you to do. Um, they hung a banner. I don't know if we've got that slide. Maybe that'll come up in a minute. Um, uh, or uh, this banner at the church um, that says, um, sorry, I'm skipping ahead, but <laughs> that says Jesus is great, but Hitler is greater because Jesus died for people, but people die for Hitler. And I always think that's, it's a good example of their humor. They, have, they, they use a lot of sort of sarcastic humor. Um, and it's sort of a way of really kind of being extremely provocative, right? It's sort of forcing people to kind of think about, okay, what's, you know, how can Jesus be, or how can Hitler be greater than Jesus, right? Well, people are dying for Hitler, meaning you, the soldiers, you average soldiers, you know, Hitler's not dying for you, you're dying for him. So again, kind of getting them to question um, the idea behind the war, question the leadership and, and who's really um, sort of, you know, working for them. To me, this is also part of something that is really, I think, sort of, powerful and, and kind of provocative about the, the notes that they write, they come into it with a kind of sense and a kind of a way of talking about this to try to convince the soldiers that the ordinary German soldiers to convince them that they are victims too. Um, and that's not, we're not used to thinking about it that way. We're not used to thinking about the idea of, of you know, German soldiers as somehow being victims. But Lucy and Suzanne in the notes were essentially saying, you have been fooled, you have been duped, right? And so um, give up the cause because the cause is not worthy, right? Because you've been fooled into this. So I think they, they approach this with a lot of empathy for these soldiers. They, they actually almost see writing these notes as a form of rescue. I think they really see that they're trying to rescue these soldiers from the lie that Hitler has, has propagated. Um, and using every way that they can, you know, humor, um, poetry, uh, you know, anything that they can come up with to try to kind of prick the conscience of ordinary soldiers and getting them to kind of think about what they were doing. And here in this slide, um, you see that they're, they're drawing on something that was so famous and so popular of the day, this, this poem called Die Lorelei. It's a very, very famous German poem. It's turned into a song. Everybody in Germany would know it. It's one of those things that everybody would have learned in school. Everybody would have sung the song. And it's basically the, the poem is about uh, sailors who are lured to their deaths by a siren song, right? So a siren, they hear a siren, like the mythical siren uh, singing on the rocks and the, the, the boat goes over to her, they're lured to her and then the boat crashes and, and sinks. So they take this, Lucy and Suzanne take this very famous poem and they put their own spin on it, right? So here, they turn Hitler into the siren, right? So Hitler's the one who's, inst except instead of this version, instead of him singing a beautiful song to lure the sailors, he's screaming like a madman. And yet 
what they're saying is you've been lured to this, right? You've been lured to the rocky shoals and your, your boat is gonna crash and sink too. So um, this would have been a kind of funny, you know, a funny kind of retelling of the story that again was, would have been something that everybody would have known. And their hope was that it would have forced the men reading it to say, you know, to kind of say, well, maybe, maybe I should stop and reflect, you know, on what I'm doing here. And we'll uh, forward back. This was a, a large banner that was unfurled at the church on uh, on an important day, right? Um, I, I can't remember exactly what day they put it up. I mean, you may be thinking of the funeral um, of the of the particular uh, officer. I'm not sure it was on exactly on that day. Um, there was a, a a very important funeral that took place. Um, in which one of the German uh, officers was buried. It was actually a very large funeral. And um, later that day, um, they, Lucy snuck out and planted on his grave uh, an, a cross, a wooden cross that they had made that said, for him, the war is over. And they did this several times in the subsequent funerals as well. Um, and again, it was a way when people would come to pay their respects to their fallen comrade, they would see this little cross that said, for him, the war is over. Um, and the idea was to make the other soldiers think that, you know, he was the lucky one. Somehow he got out of this, right? But the rest of us are still stuck here. Um, I don't think the banner was done on that day, but it was in the same space or it was in the, it was in the same church. Um, and so you can see there in the photo, that's, that's the church from, take a photo taken from their home. So you can see how close um, the, where the burial site of the German soldiers uh, would have been just from their, from their own backyard. So we, um, every story that has heroines or heroes has to also have the other side. And um, here we have three of them, but the gentleman on the left, enter Captain Bode, who is the chief of the secret field police. Uh, explain, explain him and what his actions were to counter um, not just Lucy and Suzanne's resistance, but throughout the island. Right, so Captain Boda uh, of the Secret Field Police, he was the one in charge of, uh, of the police force, the, the, the men who were there to keep order. Um, they, the, the Secret Field Police operated throughout occupied territories uh, across Europe. They, uh, on the Eastern Front, they were involved sometimes in rounding up Jews and in, in uh, the, the, um, the, the Holocaust itself. Um, but on Jersey, they were there to keep order and to, to kind of defend this Atlantic wall. So uh, Boda, you see him there, he was kind of short, he was kind of stocky, um, he would often smoke a cigar, he was very much a kind of um, menacing presence to people on the island. Um, he was, he, he very much touted his good Nazi, um, you know, ideology, and he was, a, he was a strong Nazi, he would even sometimes bully even, even uh, more senior officers who were just kind of there um, maybe they weren't as ideological as him or they were just kind of there doing their service, but he would kind of, he was kind of a bully figure. Um, <clears throat> he started receiving, you know, his men, his officers, uh, his agents would find these notes. He would find Lucy and Suzanne's notes around the island and he started to collect them and he started to look to find out, you know, who, who, who was distributing these notes. If they were in fact coming from a soldier, right, this soldier with no name, if they were in fact being created by a German soldier, he certainly wanted to know. And so for four years, he looked for them. He hunted for them to try to find um, who, uh, who was writing these notes. And eventually once he finds out, uh, then um, he, uh, well, first they encounter um, uh, the man, if you go back for one second, the man in the middle, they first encounter him on the bus. Um, but then later these three men, Boda, Loza and Wolfle, along with two other men come uh, at around dinner time, they bang on the door and they basically say, we've come to search your house. And they begin to pull the house apart and um, they eventually, it takes them a little while, but they eventually find the typewriter, they find the illegal radio that Lucy and Susanna bought on the black market, uh, and they find many examples uh, of, their, of their notes, uh, along with other incriminating documents. And then they, they uh, arrest them and they take them to prison. And here's the uh, headquarters building that Boda was stationed at. That's right. And that's a photo that Lucy and Suzanne took. They snuck up there and took that photo. So it must have been, it was pretty gutsy of them to do that, just to, to with an illegal camera to get that close to the headquarters of the secret field police and to, and to take that photo. In what appears to be broad daylight. Exactly. 
And this is the prison. You mentioned they're arrested. Uh, I'll flip through some of the uh, some of the pieces from your book while they are under arrest, while they are in prison. But if you could tell us about their imprisonment, and then we'll get to the audience Q and A here. Okay, great. So they're arrested um, in um, uh, 1944. Um, they in August and they um, are immediately questioned. Um, eventually they're court-martialed, um, sentenced to death. Um, they, but, but even during this time in prison, whether it was before the trial or after the trial, um, the, the prison experience is very different than I think a lot of people think or expect from a, from a story about a World War II uh, German prison. Because the soldiers that they encounter, the, the guards that they encounter are not brutal, they're not, um, they're not even professional soldiers. Uh, and, and Lucy and Suzanne talk about this. They reflect on, their, on the men that they meet and basically say, you know, these guys are there doing their duty. Again, it's part of that kind of way that they sort of empathize with the soldiers. They also say, you know, we know what soldiers are like because our brothers and our cousins served in World War I. So we're not afraid of soldiers, right? So they kind of saw, in a way, they saw these men um, as, you know, kind of reminding them of their brothers and their, and their cousins. Um, by this point, I should also add, I mean, Lu Lucy and Suzanne are in their early 50s by this point. Um, and so the men are much younger, many of them are much younger. And so there's also kind of a, an age thing going on. But they, they end up kind of, I, I don't want to say they make friends with these guards, that would be too strong of a word, but they find a way to kind of coexist and to have a kind of relationship with these guards. They, they get to know them. Um, the guards end up helping them at times, taking care of them. Uh, bringing them, bringing Lucy extra food because again of her medical conditions, um, they the guards end up allowing them to talk to other prisoners and to help uh, and to pass notes. And Lucy and Suzanne actually pass notes back and forth to one another uh, while they're in prison. Um, this large figure you see here on the in this drawing that uh, that probably Suzanne did. Um, I, I can't prove this. I don't know this for a fact, but my my guess is that that's the that's their main jailer. His name was Otto. Uh, that's all that's all they ever refer to him as I don't know anything more about him um, and I can't say for sure that that's him but that's my that's my guess um, and Otto actually he's a, he's a daily presence in their lives and as I say he he ends up kind of helping them in many ways and taking care of them uh, at times and yet at the same time these guards that are being reasonably kind to them and reasonably uh, uh, merciful to them they are also taking out German soldiers who have been uh, arrested for mutiny and they're executing them. And Lucy and Suzanne watch these men being taken out and executed. So even though Lucy and Suzanne don't, they're not being beaten by these guards. They're, there's not a, a, a brutality, a physical brutality. There is definitely a psychological torture that they go through because they wake up every day in prison thinking, okay, today's the day. We're gonna be either executed today or we're gonna be sent off to who knows where, uh, a prison camp uh, on the continent. They, they really don't know. So. For them, every day, you know, is a kind of uh, a, a day of anxiety because they they don't know uh, what that day will hold, and yet they are able to communicate. I mean, you see here on the right uh, one of the notes that Suzanne wrote to Lucy um, in prison, and on the left is a, a letter that a fellow prisoner wrote to them. So they were able to form some community with other people in the prison. Um, in fact, it's really once they get to to jail that they realize how many other people were were resisting on Jersey that they weren't in fact the only ones. So uh, they had four years on the island of Jersey operating uh, as, as passive resistors. Um, then they spend about the last year, 10 months in, in prison. And then in May of 45, um, here's an image of the celebration of liberation. Uh, can you talk about the liberation of Jersey and their liberation? And then we'll flip through the final slides because we do have a good a good number of questions that have rolled in. All right. So the liberation happens in, in May 45. Um, Lucy and Suzanne basically watch the prison, sort of the, the Germans, once they realize that the end is coming, they start to release prisoners. <clears throat> but Lucy and Suzanne don't get released until just moments before the Germans surrender. Um, I mean, they really end up getting held right until the very end. And I don't know why that is exactly. I don't know why they were the, the very last prisoners to be released. But once they are released, um, they come out uh, of the prison into the streets. They, they, um, 
they see the throngs of people, they hear Winston Churchill on the speakers, you know, giving his speech, uh, talking about the liberation, talking about uh, the, the end of the war. Um, they're sort of overcome with emotion, but then they have to kind of figure out how to rebuild their lives uh, because they do, obviously they have survived the war. Um, they're not executed after all their sentence had been commuted. Um, and, um, but they have to kind of figure out how to make sense of it all and how to rebuild. Their home had been confiscated by the German army had been looted, everything had been taken out. So they go on what they call the furniture hunt, where they go around looking all over the island for their belongings, their furniture, old books, you know, things that belong to them. They recover a lot of it, not all of it. Um, but they're also confronted, you know, with questions about, you know, how did the local population comport themselves during the war? Um, they realize that uh, the people they, Lu Lucy even says something like the people who are now cheering the allies on the day of liberation, they were the same people cheering the arrival of the German soldiers, right? And not literally, not cheering them because they were glad that they'd taken over the island, but coming down to the, to the water, welcoming them because they had, you know, when the Germans arrived, they had to figure out how to, how to live this new life, how to live under occupation. So now on the, on the end of it, you know, Lucy and Suzanne kind of point out there's some hypocrisy there. There's been a lot of local looting. There's been a lot of people who've who have collaborated with the Germans. There were a lot of women who took up with German soldiers uh, during the occupation. So, you know, they try to sort through a lot of these things and it, and it gets hard. And, um, and eventually um, um, Lucy uh, succumbs to her many illnesses and she dies in 1954. Um, and Suzanne lives uh, almost 20 years longer and dies in the early 1970s or commits suicide in the early 1970s. Um, but those years after the war, you know, it's a, it's, this is a great, photo of, of Lucy on the beach outside their house, um, you know, looking happy, looking relaxed, but, um, but there was a lot of still kind of working through um, the issues. Um, and I put this quote on here that um, they, they encourage, the, the way she puts it is, I wrote to encourage men, including the German soldiers to liberate themselves. And I always like to point to the fact that, that there's at least a little bit of evidence that that happens because uh, not long after the war ends, they get a letter from one of their former guards, one of the men who guarded them in prison. He writes them a letter from a British POW camp. Basically, it says to them, you know, greetings, I'm doing well, my family is safe. And I always think that's sort of a remarkable thing that, that somebody who had guarded them and who was tasked, you know, with keeping them in prison as, as the enemy, then somehow after the war wants to write them a letter <laughs> just to say hello. And to me, that's kind of a, a sense of this sort of liberation maybe that, that that guard had sort of liberated himself to a certain extent. And I, uh, I think I erroneously said a passive resistance, the resistance, collaboration, occupiers, occupied. It's, there is no fine line. It's all just a gray murky area for those who live there. And certainly what Lucy and Suzanne did was at great personal, personal risk. Um, the, uh, the first question uh, leads into this. Are there any um, monuments or statues in recogn recognition of Lucy or Suzanne on Jersey? Uh, could you tell us about this here? So this is a, a monument to the liberation more generally um, in Liberation Square um, in Jersey, which is right there at the port uh, in St. Helier. There's not anything specific to them other than there is a plaque on their house. So the house that they owned, there is a, a sort of, it's really more of a historical marker that says, you know, here live, you know, I don't remember exactly the wording of it. Um, but they are, it's funny, after the war, people on the Channel Islands really didn't want to talk about the war experience, even things like resistance. They really wanted to suppress that memory. So it's only been more recently. I mean, as you see here, this monument didn't get unveiled until 1995. Um, it took a long time for folks to kind of work through the, the legacy and the memory of the war. Um, and so uh, there's, so I, so I think, you know, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, there's been a lot more talk about that, including a lot more talk about what Lucy and Suzanne did, although usually it's talked about as part of a larger story about, uh, about resistance on the island. Um, my book, I think, is really the only book that really talks specifically about them and really tells tells their story. But in terms of any other specific monument, there's not one that I know of to them directly. Um, we have a few questions that are similarly themed. Um, were you able to document any instance in which a German soldier reacted to a note in a supportive manner? Were there desertions? Did any 
disappearances take place. Um, can you tell us about any effect that this actually had a proven effect on the German occupiers? Right, it's a great question. Um, and there's not a lot of evidence simply because there, those documents don't exist, right? There's not Germans who are saying, oh, I've read this note and I realized I needed to, <laughs> you know, to do something different. There is one though, one that they talk about, that Lucy and Suzanne talk about, where they meet uh, a man named Kurt Gunther and they actually meet him in prison. And he talks to them about the notes. He's read their notes. Um, he, um, he's inspired by them and he wants to desert. In fact, he does and he goes and stays in their house, um, the ho this, this uh, granite you know, farmhouse that they, that they have bought, he goes and stays there um, for a while. And the, the maid, even though it's been confiscated, their maid is, is able to continue to live in the house and she kind of you know, shelters him secretly for a while. And, then, and he, writes, he continues to write to them and say, I'm at, I'm at your house. And then later on, he, um, he leaves and, and goes elsewhere. Um, Lucy references herself, another soldier, as well, although I don't have any documentation from his side of things, just her brief mention that there was another soldier that, that uh, was inspired by their work. To me though, the best evidence of the fact that this was, was either having an effect or, or the fear of it having an effect was, was that they were chased down for four years. I mean, I, the secret field police wouldn't have put the time and energy into it, I don't think, if they thought that this was a meaningless activity. So the fact that they were hunting them for four years or whoever the author, they didn't know at first who the author was, um, but the fact that they continued to look for, um, for so many years to me suggests that this was something that um, they were taking seriously either because of the fear that men might read the notes and react or that maybe they were seeing something um, but that just doesn't show up because those documents don't remain um, to be able to truly document that. And um, let's go a little more into that. A few of the questions had to, had to do with your research process. Archives, is there a library that uh, covers Lucy and Suzanne's work, wartime work, not necessarily their artistic work? And um, you know, wh how did, what was your process? How did, you, how did you bring this story to life? Right. So there were two, there were, well, there were three major sources um, for looking at, at this. First of all was the archive on Jersey. Um, and so I spent some time there. A lot of that archive has also been digitized. Um, and so I was able to do some of that at a distance, but others, uh, other documents were not digitized. So I was able to go there and spend some time and the folks there were extremely helpful and very, uh, uh, it's a great archive to work in. Um, there's also a big collection of documents at Yale University. Uh, and so I spent some time at Yale in their special collections library. They have basically all of Suzanne's material, surviving material, um, is at Yale. Um, and exactly how it got there, I'm not entirely sure other than it was purchased somehow, um, but it's ended up as part of their special collection. Um, and then there's also a, um, a book that was published. Um, so Lucy, so their works, their artistic work gets rediscovered in the 1980s basically by a French philosopher who then writes a, a, a biography of Lucy, it really gives her the credit for the work, even though I would argue it's really both of them doing this provocative artwork. But he ends up, um, this philosopher in France publishes many of Lucy's writings posthumously. So, um, so many of those writings are letters that she wrote after the war in which she describes what happened during the war. So those are kind of the three major sources, two archives and then one um, sort of published work that, uh, that really I you know, took from all, all of those and, and pieced together. And in many cases, it did actually take a literal piecing together um, of this because a lot of those documents were very fragmentary, um, scattered. And so it was, it was very much, I mean, all research is like putting a puzzle together, but this, in some ways this work I think was even more so um, than previous books that I had written. Um, I have a, uh, a few questions again that meld into one. Um, it's a fascinating story, untold or relatively unknown. Maybe, maybe some folks on Jersey know of it. Um, are there any plans to make it into a movie or a series or anything? Well, I, I, that would be great. I'm, I'm hoping that someone will pick it up. Uh, my, my literary agent handles that end of things. And I know that they're, you know, they put feelers out and have, have conversations with producers all the time. Um, I, I continue from time to time to get emails from people who say, oh, I'm really interested. Are the film rights available? 
Um, so far, we don't we don't we don't have any concrete plans. But um, every time I, I talk to folks about it, I get this question. People say, "Wow, this really should be a a movie or a Netflix series or something." So um, so hopefully, hopefully one day that would be great. Hopefully, somebody today that's watching has a <laughs> has a phone call they can make. Right. Right. Um, I'm, I'm going to reserve the right for the last question. What was it all for? One of the questions sort of came up uh, from the audience. Did this have any real effect? Was it really an attempt to undermine the occupation and the overall war efforts? Uh, Lucy stated, I can't possibly tell you what it meant to me. The work was at least something that was mine, an open door, a hope, and at the same time, an, an obsession. Was this a way, and not to diminish it or the risk they took, was this a way for them to pass the time or was this really ingrained in their spirit to try to do right? That's a great question. And, and I think in some ways, I think it's both. I mean, I think that they, I don't think they went into this naively, somehow thinking that, you know, oh, we can write a few notes and the Germans will leave. Like, I don't, I don't think that they thought about it that way. They understood that if they were going to do this, that they were going to play the long game, that this was this would this might take years, but they didn't know how long the war would go on. Um, it was certainly something that played to their strengths as artists, as creative people, as writers, you know, they this was what they could bring to the table. This was what they these were the tools that they had with which to resist. Um, they didn't they couldn't do it through violence. They couldn't do it through other means. This was um, was what they had. Um, they also, again, to kind of go back to that idea, saw this as a kind of act of empathy, a kind of act of rescue, you know, that, that, that if there is, even if there's one mind that we can change, even if there's one heart that we can reach, then it's worth it, right? Um, but I do think, as your question implies, that, it, that at least in part, it's also about them. Um, you know, Lucy in particular, because of her, her physical health, because of mental health issues, her childhood, I talk about this more in the book, um, very troubled childhood. She really had sort of suffered for a long time and I think was always trying to kind of make sense of herself. Who am I? I think a lot of the artwork that they did was kind of around this question of, of you know, who, who, who am I supposed to be, you know, trying to understand herself as a person. And what I have, I think, sort of learned through writing the book was that this was the way that I think that Lucy in particular, but really both of them, came to make sense of themselves through this work. I think that this was kind of the moment where all of these threads of their lives kind of came together and they were able to kind of finally sort of say, okay, this is who we are, this is what we stand for. Um, and it's meaningful and it's meaningful in this moment because it's, it's trying to make a difference in this extraordinary circumstance that we find ourselves in. So for me, I think it's, you know, I say it's, it's sort of both. It's on the one hand, it's these are our tools that we can use to fight the fight. But at the same time, this is helping us to, to be the people that we finally want to be and to become. And it, and it is passing the time. It is helping us to make sense of the experience, but that it, it had a very personal meaning for them in that way. Great. Well, thank you for uh, bringing these two people to life for our audience today, but also in this wonderful book, Paper Bullets by Dr. Jeffrey Jackson. Uh, it's, it's great to find a book that's submitted to us by an author, a publisher, or a friend of the museum, and it really does open the staff's eyes that there are still many stories to be told. You've told two of them wonderfully, Dr. Jackson, and thank you very much for telling it today with our audience. Um, we uh, hope that you all tune in to all of our other programming. Next Wednesday, we have our second partnered program with the Pileski Institute of Warsaw, Poland where we look at World War II history, witnesses and memory, and we'll be discussing the outbreak of the war, the outbreak in the United States and the outbreak in Poland. And we hope you join us for that. But I also hope you take a look at Dr. Jackson's webpage and also uh, you can go to his webpage and find out how you can get a signed copy of his book. And it's a, it's a great read. I read it a couple times in preparation for this and. It's, it's a remarkable story of two remarkable women and you've done a remarkable job. So thank you very much, Dr. Jackson. Well, and thank you so much for having me today. It's great fun to talk to you, I appreciate it. Well, we hope to have you in New Orleans and you can uh, give a lecture on your French jazz book. So. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> great, all right, thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>